we are here today with Mike Piper and Kyle White of Uniband Canada. Mike Piper is the VP of Development for Uniband Canada, and Kyle White is the Regional Operations Manager. My name is Allison Rogers. I will be moderating the session today with Kyle and Mike. They've got lots to talk about, so you probably won't hear too much from me, but I might jump in with a couple of questions here and there. So that's basically what we've got planned for today. We're talking about ADAS and glass repair. Mike and Kyle have a lot of experience in the industry, obviously, and as well as uh, how this impacts the industry overall. So we've got lots to talk about, and um, I'm just going to pass the mic over to them. We're going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the session, so uh, be sure if you have any questions, ask them throughout. We will circle back to them at the end. But without any further ado, um, I'll just pass it over to you, Mike. Let's get started. I will share my screen and get the presentation up. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Allison. Kyle, good afternoon. Good morning to those in uh, the Pacific time zone as well. I'm going to kill my video, save some bandwidth. I see some uh, really familiar names on, uh, on our participant list, so I'm really glad that you're here with us today. And if we can, uh, we can advance along as we get into a deep dive, I don't know uh, how much deeper I can go. Kyle is here to answer your technical questions. I'm just going to throw him completely under the bus right out of the gate. So there you go. Uh, go ahead if you don't mind, Allison, we can move along. So what are we talking about when we talk about technology advancements, right? We, we think like a consumer, family safety, avoiding accidents. This is all stuff we perhaps as we repair cars on a day-to-day -day basis take for granted. Fuel economy is a big factor, customer convenience, connectivity, but beyond obvious safety reasons, this is a massive selling feature in a very competitive automotive landscape. So other factors uh, that you, you might want to pay attention to. They've reduced the weight of vehicles for increased fuel economy. Who doesn't care about that right now? I mean, really looking at the price of fuel across the country, manufacturers are, are very much at the forefront. Think about non-combustion, go to the EV side. We need to reduce the weight of these vehicles, add additional safety features as a result, strengthen the structure. There's so much complexity now involved in, in the repair procedure. And ADAS, cameras, sensors, this is a very, very big part of that. So when you think about that, hybrid drives and supplemental battery units and, and all the different things that are now connected to this vehicle, including the internet, the ability for that data to be gathered by OEMs is a huge factor that drives technology and advancements. Can also deliver added value, of course, right? Ease of appointment booking, uh, vehicles and manufacturers can, can assign you or give you uh, suggestions as to where the closest dealership or, or approved repair facility might be. These aren't just buzzwords anymore. This is a, a legitimate big time change and shift in our industry. And the pandemic did kind of speed that up for us. So the technology itself isn't new. Uh, like you're saying there, Mike, it kind of sped up because of the pandemic, but why has it been so kind of, as you're saying on this slide here, slow to embrace? Well, and you know, it's funny, Allison, things like telematics, uh, for example, uh, this isn't new. Th this has been around for several decades. Usually, if you look to the, the luxury manufacturers, you can get a really good handle on, on technology that's coming. And th this statement that's, that's here, which I won't, I won't read verbatim, goes back as far as 2003. So is it new? No, definitely not. Learning about and understanding how all of these sensors uh, work is, is really the key uh, to understanding ADAS. And we'll let Kyle speak to you know, repair procedures and, and uh, the right equipment and, and different options for that. But let's think of it this way. Think like a consumer. This is now an expected piece in every single car. So even the most base model of vehicle has some form of a safety system like ADAS in it. And it's not, it's not an option. It's now standard equipment. And that's because that's what the consumer has shifted towards. They like their car connected to telematics. They like their vehicle telling them that they have a flat tire. Maybe we don't, but uh, most people do. And that's a nice feature and it is a selling feature. And again, remember it's a competitive landscape. So how is this technology going to impact your business? I mean, that's what we need to think about. Mm -hmm. So how do these changes just slip under the radar? Like you're saying, obviously there's consumers that find these technologies hugely beneficial and they've no doubt been talking about them. How is this just something we've missed? And how I, have we missed? Well, and you know what? Have we missed it? Who knows? Some of us probably haven't. Some of us have. Um, some of us might be kind of busy thinking, well, I'm, I'm, most of the vehicles I repair in my facility, be it collision or, or just a service facility, you know, some of them might be 2018, 2016. I mean, these are still very much repairable vehicles. 
The reality is, as your facility becomes busier in a world that's shifting back to a more normalized environment where we're going to be driving some more, uh, potentially even with more electric uh, cars on the road, certainly, there's some key changes, right? And ADAS is one of the key drivers that we probably haven't been paying attention to, or uh, is it going to be a standard feature in every car? Is it really something that I need to invest in today? And the answer is more than likely, yeah, you probably do if you want to stay at the forefront, right? Consumers are are in tune with uh, with what that vehicle is, not just they're in tune with their Bang & Olufsen or JBL audio, they're in tune with what the car is telling them. And they like that. Cars might drive themselves at some point in the future as well, but the reality is, OEMs are marketing this technology, and that's one of the biggest changes that I want to speak to that, that might have been missed, uh, because it's, it's really, really critical uh, in a very competitive landscape. Every car has some type of safety uh, uh, feature in it. Every car has good mileage. Really, they're all put together, for the most part, by and large, very well. Um, we don't have the world of, you know, Hyundai Pony, not to pick on our Hyundai partners if they're there, but we don't have those anymore, right? That's that. These are all very, very high tech cars out there. And, and that's the reality. So is this the time to think about your facility and is it up to date and ready to do repairs? ADAS might be a, a component specific to glass that you're not paying attention to, or you could be farming out. You're not controlling that part of the repair process. And like you're saying up there with the OEMs, we all know how the OEMs move trickle down and affect us on a daily basis. Every single day, it seems like we're hearing something new from OEMs. So the impact on the industry is undoubtable. And could you elaborate on that? Well, it's certainly, I mean, look across the entire industry, right? The complexity of repair, which I spoke to already, there's certainly liability exposure that existed. Forget about windshields that existed before, uh, before glass had sensors and cameras in it. Uh, access to accurate repair planning and repair information. One of the biggest risks that uh, I want to point out here for our OEM partners, for our dealer partners, and I want to I want to have the whole audience think for a minute, like a dealer, like an OEM, when we talk about the competitive landscape, and have a look at the statement. Sixty percent of customers that received an incomplete or inadequate repair sold or traded their car within twelve months, and almost sixty-five percent switched brands. Now. That's critical if you're a manufacturer, but think like a manufacturer for a minute. You, you want to think about retention. You'd like repeat referral business. This is critical to you as well. This stat doesn't just apply to you know, a Dodge dealer or GM or Toyota dealer. This applies to your collision center, your aftermarket auto repair facility, your insurance partners, insurance companies are at risk if someone's trading a vehicle within 12 months after going through a claim all kinds of factors we need to be aware of. And glass is one component of that. And, and it really is something we need to start thinking about doing more in-house. Perfect transition, uh, in-house KPI is something we look at um, on a regular basis. Uh, and again, it's something where it's going to be very greatly affected by something like this, especially if you are offering it in-house or otherwise. So what are the KPIs that are gonna be affected and how can we kind of control that? Well, certainly cost of repair is critical. Um, and when we think of cost of repair, we're not just thinking about, um, you know, the consumer or our insurance partners. We're thinking about just the overall cost, the length of repair, uh, OEM versus salvage. If you can repair a factory installed windshield, you should. That's the reality. I mean, if it can be repaired, why replace it? That's, that's the methodology behind this. The factory installs it. Not that we don't uh, do it properly, Kyle, but the factory has a very, very uh, closed environment in, in their in their warehouse and their manufacturing facility, we should be looking to do that. Those KPIs are critical. If you're farming out a glass or a windshield repair or replacement to someone down the street who could be a trusted partner, you might be extending your length of rental. You could be extending your cycle time, your keys to keys time. Uh, you might not know if you're using the right windshield in there because who knows what your, uh, what your vendor partner is, uh, is installing. And are you going to spend the time? It's fine to say we'll do it, but will we? Uh, time is of the essence, in, in a uh, certainly in a body shop, but in all automotive repair. Consumers are busy. People are in a hurry. They want their vehicle back. We all know uh, those pressures exist. And it's something we really need to think about. So those KPIs can be affected. And we can also impact them a little bit if we think about equipping the facility with not just the right equipment, with the right training, with the right partners and with the right knowledge so that we're dedicated. 
if you're in just collision repair, which I know this is probably heavily skewed towards body shop audience, but the reality is why wouldn't you want to bring a, a customer back for, for a windshield replacement? Why, why just wait for that accident when you can build that trust and that, uh, that referral program? ADAS equipped windshields are not unlike ADAS equipped bumpers, cameras, uh, front grills. This is all really, really critical. And Kyle, if you don't mind, this is probably a great time for you to dig a little bit deeper into the tooling and repair processes and, and some of the things that, that maybe the industry hasn't been thinking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So oh, Kyle, let's pass it over to you, Kyle. There you go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, when when we look at the trend overall in terms of manufacturing, you know, you take electronic vehicles uh, as as one piece of, or pardon me, as one example um, of how the technology has changed in our inter- industry. Even base model vehicles like Corollas and Civics are now coming embedded with all types of ADAS technology. And anyone who's ever driven a vehicle that has ADAS can appreciate why it's a technology we're going to see stick around. Uh, it offers not only comfort with things like adaptive cruise control, but also safety with you know, forward collision alert, lane keep assist, things along those lines. So um, in the world of calibration, there are several types. And of course, what I'm gonna be speaking to is more along the lines of auto glass, which I'm most familiar with. So there's really three types of calibration. This slide is actually an important one to speak to because it can often be something that I won't call it misleading because this is what you might call a a much more in-depth comprehensive calibration. What we see on the screen here is a Volkswagen Golf. And this is between Volkswagen and Audi, certain model years would call for a four wheel alignment along with a static calibration. So I think in the world of calibration, this is something someone can look at and think, oh boy, these, you know, this is extremely in depth. So this is sort of a rarity. Um, what you're seeing here in front is the static target boards. So different target boards can look a little bit different from unit to unit, but overall they're very similar. And then of course, this vehicle's on an alignment rack with the sliders between the front and rear wheels. So um, this is sort of the exception to the rule, if you will, very uncommon. And luckily we are outside of that uh, in terms of those model year ranges with Volkswagen and Audis. But your first main calibration you see often is a static calibration. So this is done in shop with target boards. Some of your other tools are measuring tapes, laser laser depth finders, um, things along those lines. You need roughly 13 to 23 feet in front of the vehicle. There are several different types of calibration equipment, all having different ranges needed. Um, Then based on the manufacturer's specifications, the unit calibrates to those targets as landmarks essentially to ensure the camera is properly identifying objects to the front and the side of the vehicle itself. Then you've got what's called a dynamic calibration. So this is actually a real life scenario out on the road going 60 kilometers or more with the calibration unit plugged into the mainframe computer of the vehicle. Essentially what it does, it erases the database of information in order to draw a new imaginary center line between the left and right boundaries of the lane. Um, what it does is it basically uses the landmarks of the road to read as a, I call it a true north, to make sure that as your wheel is turning, it's bending that imaginary line between the two boundaries properly. Then you have a universal calibration, and effectively it's a combination of both. We see this mostly with Hondas, Acuras. It's a static calibration in shop and then taken out on the road, and a dynamic calibration takes place at that point. So the unit I'm most familiar with um, has a fantastic website, provides calibration steps for each type of vehicle. It provides a degree of difficulty, um, basically a step-by-step breakdown of exactly what needs to be done. So anyone not in the world right now, it really truly is broken down step-by-step for exactly what's required throughout each calibration process. Um, to boot, very good technical support as well. Of course, anything like this where, you know, to some it's something that they're familiar with, to others it's not. Very good technical support with most calibration units out on the market right now. So there are some customer requirements um, in terms of calibration. For example, they, it is required when they bring the vehicle in, they need to have three quarters of a tank to a full tank of gas. Vehicle weight needs to be as close to factory as possible. Typically, we just tell customers, look, remove any heavy belongings from the vehicle. 
um, just so there's nothing too weighty in there. And also the tire pressure needs to be what the factory recommendations are for, which of course we can typically handle in shop. The main thing with calibration that you're looking for is a calibration receipt. At the end of it all, we need to show that the technician has observed all the calibrated features, all the ADAS features have been calibrated and are working properly when it's all said and done. And that for us is sort of the, uh, the pinnacle of what we're dealing with to, to ensure that we are completely through a job. Yeah, I know documentation is so important. I mean, not to get too off topic, but there was a situation of back uh, about a year ago where CBC reported that a dealership, a woman got her car back from the dealership and someone took it for a joyride when really it was a dynamic calibration and something, it was just a miscommunication there. So it's important to communicate these different types of calibrations and understanding obviously exactly what's needed. Because like Kyle mentioned, this is a Volkswagen Golf. And I know in our previous conversations, you said that this unit on the bottom here doesn't, isn't required for other calibrations. Precisely. Yeah. All right. So into training, um, obviously, as you're saying here, looking at that picture, it's overwhelming. There's a lot to learn. So how do you get ahead with it? Yeah. Like anything, step by step, you know, uh, one of the most important parts of training is that you can't let your training get in the way of your throughput. You know, I, I know the concept of training is let's get trained so we can start pushing this stuff up. And sometimes to get to that training can seem very demanding. So it's just very important that, that you, res pardon me, reser pardon me, reserve ample amount of time to complete training, bring your team up to speed on scanning, calibration, ADAS, just in general, um, budgeting for it each year. Even if you think you're not going to get to participate, it's important that you do budget for it. It'll never get done if we don't plan for it. So giving yourself the runway you need to budget will help you achieve your goals. Um, incentivizing your team to learn new things as well. Cross training is extremely important. Your employees uh, need to learn new roles as time goes on and rewarding our employees as well for reaching certification milestones. All these small steps contribute to a culture of training and learning within a shop and really sets you up for future success and keeps your business ahead of future advancements as well. So, you know, the other thing too is not keeping our best employees bogged down with work. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've been guilty of this. I've managed one of our shops and, you know, sometimes you get a, an all-star employee and boy, can they push work through it can cripple us when that employee leaves. So we need to make sure that all of our staff knows as many skills as they can, not to say that every technician needs to be your top technician, but certainly again, in that event, which is worst case scenario for everyone, if that one technician leaves, um, we have to have someone who can readily fill those shoes or at least get up to speed quickly. So make your, make your top employee your top trainer effectively. So, you know, ADAS calibration, really is the way of future automotive you know it's it's so prevalent now it's a technology that develops so quickly uh, and those at the forefront really do reap the rewards i mean keeping everything in shop as much as you can really really benefits the the owner manager whomever that might be um, being familiar and comfortable with working on these systems is very important while we're still relatively early in the game you know i've i've often said we're sort of through the crawl stage we're very much in the walk stage and, and there's seemingly a full sprint ahead as we look at some of the numbers um, that are projected in terms of you know, 2022, 2023, 100% of vehicles being manufactured are gonna have ADAS to them. So you know, before we know it, the older vehicles we're used to that we could in the glass industry anyway, historically pull a windshield out, install a new windshield, customers on the way, um, you know, it's, it's really is becoming a way of the past. Gotcha. Uh, and like you're saying, there's documentation, there's these tools, there's training, and there's so much more than that too. There's space for calibration. There's, it's not just all about the vehicle. So what else, what are the, in a nutshell, the things you need to focus on if you're really looking to offer ADAS calibration in-house? Yeah, you know, with calibration, it's like anything, right? It's sort of like our cell phones, you know, each cell phone accomplishes the same goal. It can make a phone call, but there are certain aspects that speak to the buyer much more. So same goes for calibration, right? They're gonna get the job done, but whether you own a body shop, whether you're a glass only shop, whether it's gonna be a combination of both, it's just really knowing which product you want. 
Um, space requirements are obviously a big item to consider when you're at looking at buying calibration equipment. Some units need a further space in front of the vehicle. So as I alluded to earlier, 13 to 23 feet in front of the vehicle is typically the range. Um, certain units, again, geared toward only glass, but others will do your front side, rear body sensors, things along those lines. Um, some sy systems offer more adequate initial training as well as ongoing training. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically with, in terms of hardware, static calibration is really where it comes into play in terms of the, the um, boards, I'm trying to say. So what you're seeing on the screen here, that is your standard target board. Um, there can be variations, but this is really your, your space consumer. And then of course that 13 to 23 feet in front of the vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, I know with some of this up to date um, or modern units that are coming out on the on the market now, they can account for uneven floors and up to like certain millimeters and whatnot, but you also need a certain floor level space and it's just lots of different requirements there for the static calibration. Um, but for a dynamic, like you're saying with the just traveling, driving on the road, is there what tools do you need for something like that? So dynamic is really just the calibration unit itself. Um, not to say the road is doing all the work, but basically, again, it's recalibrating from that camera using landmarks of the road. So really, it's just two, te two technicians in the vehicle, one driving, one conducting the steps on the screen itself. But for a dynamic, that's effectively it. Gotcha. All righty. So we've been talking about the glass industry and I know that glass, uh, you mentioned there, Kyle, it's your kind of focus and specialty here. Uh, the glass industry, give us a general overview. What's a general overview of kind of what we can expect to how it's going to integrate with the automotive aftermarket and collision repair going forward? Yeah, I think on this slide, I mean, you know, short of reading it verbatim, um, just speaking to my own personal experience, you know, I managed uh, one of our Uniban locations through the adoption of auto glass. So going through that learning curve and then also the growth of ADAS and getting the calibration equipment and going through that learning curve as well. Um, so really the more you can come full circle as a repair facility, again, the more beneficial it is. And it's just step by step each day. Um, you know, you really notice now in shop, the, the numbers ring true here, three and five required calibrations. Some days it's five for five in terms of the calls that you're getting that require calibration. So the uptick that we've seen in the last you know, certainly five, 10 years, but even in the last two years has been pretty monumental as well. So um, mostly just to say, adapting with the times, being your local expert, um, it's just, that's where you can really reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's a lot of movement in glass, three and five jobs, like you just said there. I mean, all the data on the screen, aside from reading it verbatim, we can, can't communicate it better. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, so like we're perfect segue. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in glass. That last slide speaks just to that. So let's delve in. So what kind of opportunities are available here? Well, thanks, Allison. I'll uh, uh, thanks, Kyle. That was informative, and I see a couple questions popping up. So we'll uh, we'll have some time to address those as well. But what I was thinking is, as Kyle speaking, and it kind of dawned on me, and, and I mentioned it. If you can own a part of a, the repair process, you should. And, and again, not to just pick it as a collision repair audience, but if you're in the body shop business and you have a lull into the late spring, early summer, what prevents you from making that investment in your team and, and in your equipment to become uh, that resource for perhaps the repairer down the street who doesn't want to make that investment? You've got the opportunity to you know, have those sublets come to you and have those repairs completed correctly. If you think about glass in, in that space, there's really a diversity model, right? So not just adding a new revenue stream, but really looking at diversifying in your community and, and becoming the one-stop shop, as opposed to just one thing. And then we, we kind of you know have two, three months off and ramp up again, or if you're in the West, pray for hail, or in my case, don't pray for hail, but uh, that's me as a consumer. So. And for our insurance partners, they don't pray for it either. I know I see a few of them here, so hopefully they're smiling. But I want you to think about that. It goes without saying, right? Uh, adding glass to your business portfolio does give you another, another vertical, really, to be more profitable. And, and that's not a bad word. It's okay to diversify. When, uh, when the world zigs, it's okay to zag, right? So 
Uh, diversifying your customer base isn't a bad thing either. I mean, if you're in a dealership environment uh, and you offer glass and you're, you know, let's say you're a Toyota dealership, if you're offering glass, you might end up with someone who drives a Hyundai. Uh, you might end up with with an Acura customer in there who is now looking around while, while you're performing the repair uh, to their windshield or recalibrating for them. Gives you a chance to educate. And that, that goes across the board. If someone's used to going to you know, ABC uh, auto repair and they end up at your store and, and they had no idea that you can do wheel alignments, replace glass, maybe fix a bumper chip, a couple of dents and scratches, you've got a better opportunity. So the diversity isn't just to the portfolio of the business, it's really the customer base as well. Think about the cost, cost and time savings, right? I mean, you know, doing a, a dynamic calibration uh, where you have to operate someone's car certainly does require someone leaving, taking the vehicle for a potential you know, drive to get recalibrated. But the truth is, if you're subletting down the road, you've got a, you know, another piece of paper or another document, more emails to go back and forth, phones ringing, if you're doing this in-house, it can actually help save you costs and some time as well. If you can do that, your KPIs will instinctively go up. I mean, that just goes without saying. Thinking about procurement, procurement's a huge piece of uh, any system that you can possibly consider um, for those of you who are in a, in a repair network or for those even as independents. When you're in a larger banner or a larger network, you have that opportunity to take advantage of distribution rebates and bottom line savings, right? So by looking at a system such as Uniglass, you instantly have access to some of those savings you might not otherwise get as an independent. Industry relationships and driven brands are going to speak a little bit too. Um, we, we have a huge, we're the largest after, automotive aftermarket company in the world now with the car wash uh, business happening uh, you know, overseas and, and in North America. So you've got all of that leverage at your fingertips. It's something to consider when, when thinking about a partnership, even if, if you don't, thinking about glass as a, an independent isn't a bad idea either, or as a dealership, but think about that, the larger ability to leverage all of those partnerships and relationships that could come with a company like a Driven Brands. Certainly marketing support, who has time to, to spend <laughs> trying to do marketing to every single thing uh, in their community, this can help, um, this can help a lot. Uh, by joining a banner or looking at a network because it can help take some of that extra pressure off of you and let you do what you do best. Run your business, repair cars, repair them properly, uh, educate and, and retain your staff, right? And last but not least, and I certainly don't want to leave this for, this is, this is the most important piece and Kyle is our, our expert on the panel today. Really, it comes down to performance support, having that team who's there to help with your training, help and understands equipment, understands this industry and knows how to do proper repairs at your fingertips is another real, real big point for consideration when you think about opportunity in glass. Don't just think about training this yourself, you know, you doctor, Google, anything now, but the reality is some of the, the best trainers you have could be at your fingertips. All you have to do is, is pick up a phone or send a text or, or reach out. So, so that's kind of what we're, we're thinking about as you move forward. Um, I can leave, leave it with that. We've got some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You've both given us a lot to think about here. Uh, thank you, Mike and Kyle. And if anyone has any questions that maybe pop up after we're done the Q&A here, or if you want to reach out to Mike for more, it's uh, Michael Piper at DrivenBrands.com. His email, Michael.Piper at DrivenBrands.com. Email's up on the screen right now. So feel free to reach out. Mike would love to chat with you. Not to speak for you, Mike, but I'm pretty sure you're, <laughs> you're okay to chat. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> We've got some questions here, like Mike said. So I will just uh, pass them over to you too, and you guys can decide between yourselves who's best to answer it. But first question here we've got is from Andy Latham. Uh, training, should training be completed by a credit, sorry, should training be accredited by a training provider or is in-house training sufficient? And I can take that one. So typically you want to have it by, you want to have it accredited. So with the calibration units, at least that, we have preferred through Uniglass Plus, we do have a proper training facility. So one of two things that can either be done in-house um, at a warehouse, um, at our, one of our supplier warehouses, or it also can be done in shop, but either way, it would be an accredited training process. 
Um, and again, with continued support, I think it's really important that piece that Mike said, you know, not only does the manufacturer of the calibration unit typically give very, very good support, but we also have it available throughout our network. And we've got a lot of people, and especially as time has gone on and people have learned it, we've got a lot of really good people um, around us that can offer that really helpful support. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when things are changing so fast, continued support is crucial uh, for the industry knows. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Andy, for your question. We've got another question here from William Winter. Calibration costs. I've seen charges for calibration on different ADAS systems vary. Do some systems require an ample amount of time where others not so much? Yeah, so I can take that one again. So yes, I mean, really, so sort of going back to the calibration units, um, again, the one I'm most familiar with, basically how it works is you would go onto their website, you would choose the vehicle, and it will actually give you a degree of difficulty. So it can give you a one up to a five. So at that stage, you would account for that amount of time needed, right? Static calibration is most often I shouldn't say that dynamic calibration is most often the most time consuming because it's a combination of both. Static in and of itself is certainly the more time consuming calibration. Um, dynamic out on the road, it can take anywhere between 15 to 35 minutes. So yes, completely. As we know with models in general, makes and models, some are a little more difficult to deal with than others. And the same rules apply to the technology within the vehicles as well. So certainly to that end, you can vary in terms of time frame needed to actually recalibrate. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. And um, just back on that training question, another point that Roland uh, Hull wanted to make in the chat to uh, who asked that question, sorry, Andy Latham, it's just nice to be able to hang that certification on the wall if it comes from an accredited source, tells your clients that you're officially certified, you know. If I were a consumer walking into a shop, I don't personally understand it. Ask them, look up at a frame and see this, and that gives me reassurance. So, exactly. Another it's, question. It, it Sorry, I was just going to say it really is huge, that particular component, just because there is so much conversation swirling around calibration, and it is such an important piece of the job as a whole and the liabilities that can come associated with it. So it, it is giant when you can show that accreditation, for sure. Well, one sensor being even a millimeter off can translate to six feet down the line. So we not to scare people here. We're not here to do that. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the next question we've got from Peter Broda. He says, can calibrations be done by any body shop or do they require dealer equipment that is not provided to body shops? So, no, it, it, it can be done by any body shop. So basically, if you buy a full scale piece of equipment, you can do a calibration on virtually any vehicle. Um, and I say virtually any because you, you can still have the odd instance where it's possible it can't be done by that calibration unit. But there is, as, as we've advanced within this, to say that one calibration unit couldn't, there are also some remote ones that can be used as well. So yeah, I mean, you is, if you get a full scale system, you can basically do anything in house providing that you have the space for it. And of course, assuming that the piece going in the vehicle um, is a proper OEE part as well. Gotcha, okay. Robert Blankarn says, are any OEMs looking to lock the calibrations behind certain systems or scan tools? I don't think we can com concretely say anything like that, but anything you guys have heard? <laughs> For me, no. I don't know, Mike, if you have any input on that. You know, um, I, I couldn't speak on behalf of every manufacturer. I, we can never rule it out, will they? It, it depends on, I guess, the systems. It's something to be prepared for. And it's a great question, uh, Robert, honestly. But to have that predictability about what certain manufacturers want, I guess you can ask, do certain manufacturers want specific tools to do you know, proper repairs? Uh, that could be through your welding. You know, is there a certain procedure you have to follow? And we certainly know in, in maybe some of the higher end or luxury cases, you can't even order parts for certain vehicles unless you go direct to a certified repair facility. So will they lock the uh, software? It's hard to say at this point, but it's something to be prepared for. I mean, anything is possible, right? So. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there are several OEM, like OEMs procedure. If you're being certified by an OEM, there are calibration tools that are outcome OEM recommended and uh, certified. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
All right, so Vince is asking, are all scanning tools integrated with all calibration units? So can every scanning tool do both static and dynamic? Yes, so, and I don't wanna speak for everyone. Again, I keep alluding to the piece, of, the, the unit that I'm most familiar with. So what I'm most familiar with, yes, absolutely. It will do each type of calibration. I can't think at least in passing of any calibration tool that won't do the pair or the three of them, I should say. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Uh, another question here. We've got, uh, how do you manage the increased costs associated with ADAS and calibrations? Obviously, you went through a lot of tools, different training things you need. How is that? That's a big, big question mark for a shop sometimes. So what are some strategies you can take for something like this? Yeah, and I can, I can answer that. I mean, it kind of goes to, as we were summarizing it and going through our, our conversation this afternoon, the diversity into the new revenue stream uh, can help you make sure you're not dependent on just the one profit center um, or, or just the two. Maybe you can have three profit centers in there. Really use these tools for both insurance and retail. Um, understand that there is, a, there is a, a big, big industry out there that potentially we haven't been paying attention to, and we should be, because it's a need. It's a need across this country and in every country and anywhere that there's a car driven. So if you can think about using the tools for not just repair through insurance, but through retail as well, you should, you should maximize a better return on your investment um, by looking at that, uh, that initial investment. So, and remember, as I indicated, why not become that trusted source on the corner, so to speak, for, for some of your vendor partners who might need calibrations or windshield replacements. That's, that's, that's the mentality to think uh, when, when you look at the investment. Absolutely. And to tag on the end of that as well, we have had some stores within our network who have become that sort of hub, let's call it, for calibration. You know, it's been fantastic for them. We're also seeing mobile calibration become prevalent now. So, you know, it, it is an industry that we're just seeing grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's the, the whole point of today's discussion is getting yourself at the forefront and getting ready to be prepared to offer this when inevitably 100% of new vehicles do come with ADAS, which is pretty much right now. So um, we've got another question from Andy here. It says, in the UK, we have insurance industry requirements that all insurance approved repair shops need to be trained and certified with technicians, even the shops that do not do their own calibration. He's asking if we have the same kind of thing here in Canada. I'll kind of pass it over to you. I know a bit of the answer, but I'll let you two handle it. I don't know if you know on that one, Mike. Sure. It's more just like insurance. I guess he's asking more DRP relations. Do uh, like we don't have a program that requires insurers to be partnered with body shops, but there are a lot of DRP direct repair partnerships. If for an insurer to embark on a on a partnership like that with a body shop, that body shop would most likely have some certified and trained technicians, tout some OEM certifications. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I would think I would agree with that. Um, and that's by carrier. Again, hard to speak um, for all carriers across this country, but uh, you know, certainly some, if not all, have, have that uh, requirement. So uh, is it like the UK? I, I'm, I, I would not be the right person to answer that for you, but uh, I, I think you covered it, Allison, as well. So Yeah, it's kind of my main understanding there, Andy. I can't compare it to the UK, but in a direct repair relationship, the insurer would always make sure the body shop was someone that would be repairing the vehicles to OEM standards. Perfect. And then we've got Robin Taylor from Australia here asking, in Australia, one of our major insurers will not allow mobile ADAS, calibration, ADAS calibrations. Would you guys see this as an issue? <laughs> yeah, we can't yeah. really speak for Australia, but it is an interesting topic. I hadn't, I didn't know that. That's a great question for sure. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I consider an issue now, Kyle, what I, I guess it depends on the limitations or what needs to be calibrated uh, is, is the right way to, to answer that. And I'll let you certainly chime in, Kyle, with your knowledge. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the reality is, so we're starting to see mobile calibration become prevalent. But of course, you know, when we look at Canada and the four seasons that we have, you know, really the indoor space is extremely important, um, not only for the space, but the elements as well. So while we're seeing it on the uptick, it's not something we're seeing a ton of either. Most calibrations are done in shop with the unit that's specific to that shop. Gotcha. All right, keep the questions coming, guys. Got a lot of great conversation happening here. Um, but for more of a general question, what are some of the most critical ADAS issues that we should be addressing as an industry right now? 
So I think if I if I can chime in on that, and certainly Kyle, if if you like to uh, to tag in as well, I think is really it's OEM. Uh, you know, we want to look at the OEM repair procedures, the integrity of that repair, and ensuring those safety protocols for your end user. It's all about safety at the end of the day. Uh, certainly, we want to move our production facilities. We want to move vehicles in and out as quick as possible, but we want to do that the right way. We want to repair them correctly and uh, make sure that our customers are are in a safe vehicle where cameras and sensors aren't going to start beeping and going off and slowing down cars. And uh, we've, we've seen some of those horror stories before. So I really think it's about uh, you know protecting the integrity of your business, working within the OEM and insurance guidelines as well, right, for repairability uh, uh, when necessary to ensure safety. And Kyle, if you have another point, by all means. I mean, I'd echo those sentiments exactly. You know, a lot, just in shop, it, it's really taking the steps, A, that are called for within the instructions of it, like the pre-scan, making sure that you're not going to have any error codes that are going to create any issues. Because, you know, at the end of the day, once it leaves our shop, if there is an issue that comes about, it, we know it's coming right back to us. So, um, yeah, complete, you know, exactly what Mike said times two. Mm -hmm. I know um, this is just a question that comes up off the top of my head and I speak to people when I'm doing interviews with ADAS, uh, shops that offer ADAS and glass repair, something that um, we know that a lot of consumers, well, we talked at the beginning of the webinar of them, a lot of consumers do love their ADAS systems, but on the other hand of that, there's a lot of people that don't understand the ADAS systems. How do you get the consumer on your side to make them understand what, or the driver on your side to make them understand what is entailed with these systems. And if they see their repair bill, whoa, 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 why am I paying this much? And how do you make them understand that a calibration is necessary and with, don't freak them out with a scary receipt? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and it's it's been something that's building as a piece of conversation for quite some time, you know, and, and unfortunately there are, there is still a lot of conversation of, well, that's not needed in the vehicle. And that's, that's really the conversation that we're trying to change as we move forward, right? Um, again, liability is gigantic. It, you don't have to look very far online to find some of those sad tales of, you know, jobs gone awry and cases and things along those lines. So um, really, in my opinion, anyway, it all boils back down to liability, right? If I'm, if I'm replacing a windshield on a vehicle that requires that calibration, I want to make sure the customer knows exactly what the OEM specifications are calling for. Um, you know, you, you can, you can look up the Magnus and Moss Act uh, as well, but basically just, you know, we have to make sure that we're putting in equipment that is properly going to calibrate and not create any issue with any of the warranties through the OEMs and things along those lines. So um, it's just really more than anything, it's just conversation with customers um, and not to say it's a, a pitch quote unquote, but we have to make sure that they're educated on what their vehicle has and the technologies it has um, because, you know, they really, it's, boy, it sounds like a scare tactic. It can be life and death, but not that we want to paint it that way, but truly it can be, right? Mm -hmm. I know. I didn't want to make it sound like a scare tactic. I was going to say the word, I call it the L word, but you're the one that said it. So, <laughs> but I, exactly. That's where I was going with it. And it is important to think about that. There are so many cases and situations where, I mean, not so, sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was, okay, no, if I could, I was going to comment on that. And I've heard it many times uh, through my career in my past. Uh, having sold vehicles for a living many, many years ago, it's, it's impossible to show everybody every feature who purchases a car from you and they forget. Sometimes they only care about lumbar and heated seats and sometimes they care about ABS. The truth is, take that time. Is it my best advice for any part of a repair procedure? Take that time, explain to people what you're doing. Don't take for granted that they know that their car is equipped with anything because they might not. Again, it might not have been their purchase motivator from day one. And taking that extra time builds that trust. I know it's hard, time's so valuable, but we really do need to slow down. That's the number one key when, when addressing a consumer. So sorry to chime in on you, Allison. I'll let no, you I see another question. I think that's so key, uh, very key. And like we were talking at the beginning, uh, think about what difference that makes for a customer. You taught them what their system needs to, or re requires for repair. That's a huge bond of trust built there. And they're pretty likely to come back to you for any other repair that you need if you're able to build that relationship and uh, educate them in a very basic way. Um, uh, we're, we've got about 10 more minutes left on the clock here. So if you've got any more questions, keep, go, keep rolling them in. We've got another question from Roland here. He's wondering if there's a comprehensive reference data site which shows which calibrations are required with certain repairs. 
So I guess in a nutshell, when do we need to calibrate? Yes, certainly. So um, actually, in terms of a, a general one that you could access through the internet, I'm not 100% sure. So uh, again, going back to that calibration unit that I am familiar with, there it, it's basically got a broken down vehicle by vehicle exactly what's required in terms of a website that's out there just for the general public. I would say it doesn't take much to find it. If we were to look at a, you know, a Honda Accord, you know, what type of calibration does a Honda Accord need? I think you're probably going to find the result pretty rapidly anyway, mm -hmm. if that answers the question properly. Absolutely. Especially if you're someone that uh, is, is working at a body shop with OEM certifications or something and you have access to those procedures, odds are it's going to say, and after any collision, you should be calibrating if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, any and just... To, uh, to briefly hit reverse on that last one as well, when we talk about the time with the customer, you know, when we're through the calibration, we do get a calibration receipt as well. And especially when we're dealing with insurers, you know, we want to make sure we're showing that customer, A, we need their signature on the receipt anyway, but we're showing them and letting them know that, hey, this is, you know, this is what you're after when you have repairs done on your vehicle is, is, is the, the proof that it was done properly, right? And it's something that we can always fall back on at the shop. You know, we all know how it goes. You do a repair, customer goes down the road, they have an issue that's not in any way, you know, uh, um, attached to that repair, but of course you're fresh in their mind and they're back at your doorstep. So it's really our piece to say, hey, look, you know, well, we had the vehicle, everything went fine with that calibration, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings me back. I was going to bring up the point at the beginning of the webinar, you mentioned how uh, documentation is so important in printing out um, the final calibration receipt there. And it's absolutely key. And I bring it back around not to get the scare tactic spot going again, bring it back to the L word. Like we're saying the liability here, having those sheets, the documentation that you did, the calibration to exactly how you're supposed to, that can save you. Um, and you already should be doing the calibration properly anyway. Uh, so Waiting for a couple more questions to roll in if anyone's got any more question and answers, but I'll just toss this question at you guys uh, that for the moment. Um, how do we know if we have the right information for ADAS calibration requirements? I'm guessing this is depending on model, vehicle, when everything is so different, like you were saying earlier, Kyle, how do we make sure like we have the exact same, exact right one that we're supposed to be dealing with? Yeah, I'm for at least for our Uniglass Plus uh, locations and, and network, we just help coach our facilities on how to access so they can train their teams on proper steps to repair, which include, of course, consulting OEM guidelines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Always. Okay. So if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to fire them off now. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of wrap up my preamble. We had a lot of great discussion here. Um, thank you, everyone, for your insightful questions. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, conversation out of this Q&A period. So um, again, thank you to Kyle and Mike. Both of you have given us a lot of information to think about. I'm sure you've got a lot of body shops and DOS repairs scratching their heads ready to uh, delve into the world of ADAS. So thank you so much for that. Um, just a reminder to anyone, if you'd like to reach out to Mike or Kyle, feel free to reach out through Mike's email. I'm sure you can pass the message on to Kyle if you uh, <laughs> need to pass the message on there. But um, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Thanks for hosting and, and for everyone for attending as well. Really appreciate the opportunity. I know everyone's busy. So and thanks, Kyle, for co yes. Really appreciate it, bud. Thanks, um, Allison. Thanks, Mike. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. We did just get one uh, last question from Neil. He's just asking uh, about a specific program. So I, don't, I won't mention the name of the program online. I don't want to get into any other uh, things like that. But if Neil, if you want to reach out to Mike and ask them about uh, some other things, that's absolutely fine too. But yes, thank you both. Um, we'll wrap it up now. So everyone have a fantastic Thursday and I hope everyone has a great weekend in a couple of days. Thanks everyone. Enjoy guys. Bye. Bye.